introduction about Dinah. Uh, Dinah is a studio potter, illustrator, and a teacher from Portland. In 1992, uh, she completed her Bachelor's of Fine Arts with distinctions from California College of Arts and Craft, Oakland. Her ceramic pieces are a part of a folklore and a part personal narrative, uh, which documents both real and imaginative stories. Dinah's work can be found in public and private uh, collection, both in US and abroad. She has been featured on the cover of Ceramic Monthly, as well as numerous international and American publications. I welcome you, uh, Dinah. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so tell us, we'll, can we start uh, with the presentation now? Hi. Thank you, Yashashri. I appreciate uh, the lovely introduction and I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. And yes, we can go ahead and get started. So if you can just, um, I'm Please. gonna go ahead and share the screen. Sure. It'll be my screen for a second and then I'll turn so, start um, the Meanwhile, uh, for all the participants, uh, right now our chat box is uh, closed. Uh, so like once Dinah finishes her presentation, we'll be opening up our chat box. So you can ask questions uh, to Dinah. So she will be answering after presentation. Thank you. Yeah, Shashri, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, I can see. Yeah, I can see. Oh, oh. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm trying to imagine everyone so far away um, sitting and watching today. It's a, it's fun to be connected to everyone. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just get started. I'm just going to jump in. So oh, I, I want to start with me as a little girl with a little dog. Um, I was born in California. Both of my parents are from Hungary. They immigrated to the United States in 1956. Uh, so I was raised in a bicultural household and um, a lot of that has influenced my work. Uh, I've lived in um, Hungary uh, in 1983 and 84 and have traveled abroad back and forth um, over the years. My father moved back to Hungary in the mid nineties, but has since returned to the United States. So I've lived a bicultural life um, my entire life and um, uh, it has greatly influenced the way I see the world. This uh, piece here marks the very beginning of my illustrative style in ceramics. I started studying ceramics in no, 1987. I took my first studio uh, pottery class. It was a wheel throwing class. And uh, this was at a community center in San Francisco where I lived for 30 years. Uh, it was at the, at the beginning, I was just doing the basic things like throwing pots and uh, learning learning um, the overwhelming field of ceramics and not really knowing where to begin. But I soon caught the bug. And after about two years of taking studio classes, I ended uh, I enrolled myself in uh, college into the uh, California College of Arts and Crafts, where I attended for three and a half years. <clears throat> When I was in school, I still had not discovered my voice or uh, my, had my style established. And when I got out of school, I felt a little bit lost for a few years and was um, feeling overwhelmed with the prospect of a future as an artist, though I felt very committed to that. I also was working uh, full time to support myself outside of my studio practice. And I worked in restaurants, um, waiting tables, and I was also teaching classes. And I was, uh, I had a sort of conundrum in that I wanted to, I, I had a degree in ceramics, but I also had a, a minor in printmaking, which was a great love of mine. And I didn't have the time to pursue painting ceramics, printmaking, all of the things that I love to do. So I wanted to come to a place where I combined all of those um, things that I love to do into my ceramic work. And so I took on the notion of applying a dry point etching process to the clay surface, <clears throat> where I would actually use the, the surface of the clay as the 
if you would think of a zinc plate, but the clay body is, would be the plate. And I would etch the lines into the surface and then rub stains into the surface and wipe them away to, to, rele to uh, reveal the, the, the line work that I had etched into the surface. And so this piece here represents the first attempt at that process. And this piece was created in 1994. It also was the, rep, uh, the beginning of me using symbols and images in a narrative style. And <clears throat> at this time, I was really thinking a lot about flying. And so this piece has a lot of images of uh, things that fly, the bird skull, propeller, kite, a bee. And uh, so I, I, this was just an experimental piece. And uh, this is where it all began. In 1999, I was asked by, uh, I was at work and waiting tables and I met a woman who was coming in as a diner um, and she, she worked in Hungary at a ceramics factory designing tabletop ceramics that were being imported into the United States. Um, I shared with her my background um, and that my family is from Hungary and that I speak the language uh, she kept coming in for many year, for the year, and she didn't really understand that. Um, she never, it never sunk in with her that this was uh, who I was. And then one night she brought in a young Hungarian man who had just flown in from Hungary. And we started talking, and I was speaking Hungarian with him. And she, it, it hit her that this was a true story. <laughs> I wasn't telling her some fairy tale. And... Um, after that, she uh, came over to my studio and we met and she needed some uh, input on a issue she was having with some of the ceramics that were being brought in. She was having a, a glaze issue and I uh, <clears throat> suggested that perhaps we work together and um, six weeks later I was on a plane flying to Hungary and designing my own line of ceramic ware that was made and produced in Hungary. This was with, from 1999 to 2002. Um, it was called the Diana Fate Collection. You can Google it and you'll probably find a lot of pieces on eBay now. <laughs> and this is the little table that I sat at, at the, and designed. And this was just the precursor to the internet. So this was a time where everything was still done in a very hands-on way. I flew directly to the factory, worked directly with the um, the makers and the designers there, training them and teaching them how to use my style and apply it, and um, uh, to on the on the mass product production of the pots that I had designed. They were all all hand thrown. None of them were cast, um, so all of the work was still um, very handmade. So we we imported this work until 2002 after 9/11. That changed things and the, biz the company went out of business. Um, this is the team of factory members that I worked with. And I love this photograph because <clears throat> in ceramics, um, there are so many processes and steps. And I think that this is a great visual in, uh, representation of how many people, each person in this photograph represent a step in the process to make my work. Um, and I think that many times people look at clay work as being simple and easy. And uh, the truth of the matter is, is that it's a complicated process and requires a lot of skill and um, labor and knowledge by many people to, to, to achieve a successful work. This style here represents my early my earlier work. I was making this work in the early 2000s, uh, the etched work using a lot of botanical images and birds. This blackbird uh, makes an appearance a lot uh, for a number of years in my work, and it's often a representation of me, uh, self-portrait in the work. Um, this was a place setting that I created for a uh, show that I was in, NSICA is a national conference for ceramic um, uh, education in the United States. You may have heard of it. It's a huge conference that happens annually. 
And yes. there was a, sh yes, there was a show called um, La Mesa. It's no longer happening. It was happened every year for many years, consecutive years. And I was asked to create a place setting for the, for the show. And this was my entry for this. And I think this was probably in 2008, I made this play, place setting. The years are all, and this is the place setting from the side view. So it's always it's always been very important for me because ceramics is a three dimensional uh, material to use all all sides of the of the of the um, pieces. I see them. I see my work as canvases, the clay work pieces them, themselves, and that there's all uh, many opportunities to tell a story and for the story to change from different vantage points. This is another place setting for uh, I was invited again to the show and this was a few years later and this here I chose this because this was a early precursor to some of the stencil work that I'm doing now and you can see in the scalloped areas. Those are all stencil um, applications and I was thinking about it recently how when did I actually start working with stencils and I think this is this marks the the, the beginning of it. Um, it wasn't the focal point of my work, but uh, it was definitely making an appearance. Again, the, the quail here is a California quail. Um, this one's, uh, I, each show that I was in, that I was invited to um, often represent, I kind of did it thematically based on where the show was going to be. And I'm pretty sure this one was in Texas. So I chose a sunshiny uh, kind of hot palette um, and again, the quail represents me, the girl from California. Um, <clears throat> I often use a lot of botanicals in my work and um, this at this time I was using a lot of California native plants that were uh, were grown that grew in the region that I was living in, which was San Francisco, the Bay Area and um, so one, the one on the left with the blue and the rabbit is a, a sand flower. And the other one on the right, I'm completely forgetting the name of that flower, but it is also a native, a native plant. Um, and, you know, place really influences my work where I'm living. And this one, I, uh, I was living in a city, but I was also, San Francisco is a city that is an urban center, but it's surrounded by a lot of nature. So these geometric formations that take place in the center of the pieces represent the architecture and the lines and the structure of a city. Uh, meanwhile, while being in a sort of natural, surrounded by a natural landscape. Again, the figures the both the rabbit, the rabbit rabbits also uh, appear a lot in my work throughout the, since I've uh, started making work, I've been using them for many years now, also as a self-portrait, not sometimes they're enclosed in spaces, they're moving out of spaces, and usually it's representational of where I am at my life, perhaps where I'm going through, whether I'm in something or moving through something or maybe having passed through something completely. Uh, this is another platter that I did for a show in Texas. It's called The Art of the Pot. It's an invitational show. And um, I created this piece for the show and it was purchased uh, and is now part of the Rosenfield collection. If you can see on the back end of the edge of the platter um, up at the top, you'll see some scratch marks in the edge of the of the platter. I use those marks. Um, actually, that one looks more of a decorative. I'm not seeing the actual patch marks. I'm going to have to show you another picture. Um, but those are often indi those those indicate the date or the year that I've uh, made the pieces. It looks amazing. A, thank you. This is another collection I did. This was actually um, American Craft. Perhaps the magazine asked me to create a table setting for a uh, table setting feature for the magazine, and. <clears throat> My mother is a um, 
self-taught mycologist and she loves mushrooms. And at this time in my life, she and I would spend a lot of time on the telephone talking about mushrooms. And she would tell me, I would one time asked her how she knew if she got a poison mushroom and how she tested them. And she said she would, um, in her Hungarian accent, she would take a little piece off with the tip of her fingernail and put it in her mouth. And that if it didn't, if it didn't um, taste funny, then she would throw it in the pan with butter and herbs and cook it up and eat them. So this one was for my mother um, and the story behind her, um, uh, her mushroom hunting. This was a commission piece for a friend uh, who lives, who's living in Mexico. And I don't often work with cactus and cactus imagery and she wanted very specific images in it. Um, so it was a fun challenge for me. Again, the stencil work, the white cactus area is a, an, the, again, another early, um, early, early work in using the stencils. I wasn't using them extensively then, but um, at this time, this was another experiment with it. And here on this piece, you can see on the right hand edge, kind of towards the bottom, there are chicken scratches that say 13. Uh, so that means that that piece was made in 2013. And this, I've been dating my pieces like this since about 2002. So if you've ever come across one of my pieces, and you see the little number over there, you can tell what year it was made in. <clears throat> That's the number one question I get with my work was, what does that mean? This, uh, again, was another place setting that I did for La Mesa. Uh, and this was, this time, the, the um, convention was, uh, the, the conference was happening in Florida. And this was a time where I was really interested in doing scrimshaw on clay. And if you're not familiar with uh, the art of scrimshaw, it's the etching into bone or uh, teeth. Um, in the United States, the uh, whalers would use the art of scrimshaw as while well, they were away using hunting whales um, to uh, with the bones from the harvest of the of the whale, they would scratch uh, images and oftentimes create gifts or little objects of love and affection for their sweethearts. And they would rub um, ink or soot into the lines and then wipe it away. And the bone would the the etched lines in the bone would retain that the the black soot or ink. Uh, I was traveling, I was uh, dating someone who was lived on a small island in the island, uh, in the Grenadine Islands and called Beckway. And they still had a whaling tradition, an Aboriginal whaling tradition there. And I, upon learning more about it and it becoming something that I was interested in, I realized that this, the way that, that uh, Scrimshaw works was similar with the way I was working with my ceramic work. So I started um, thinking a lot about um, endangered species and the, the, in the whaling industry and historically what that meant and wanted to do a modern take on it and interpretation using clay instead of bone um, and uh, using a lot of sea images. And this is a, again, a, a, a piece that I made for uh, later again in, for Enseca another year and a collection. I like to show them all together because I often made my work in collections of pieces so that there was a story that, um, there was a story communicated by each piece as a collection or they could stand alone in individually. I'm sorry for the blurry photograph of this. This is um, again, another piece that I did for a show that I was that was called Song Catcher, and it was based on uh, the premise of the show was make a piece based on a song, and I chose Bob Dylan's Boots of Spanish Leather, <clears throat> which was about uh, if you're not familiar with the song, the song uh, is about someone who's a sailor who is sailing away to Spain, and um, uh, and 
the person is the person is that's left behind is is writing that they don't want anything back but the person to the the person that the sailor that's sailing away to to come back to them so the flower in the between the two whales is a yerba mansa and that is a native plant to california that was brought over by the spaniards to california so there is the representation of spain and then the ships. And also I use the scrimshaw style to represent the sailor and the sailor's art of scrimshaw. That picture, the tall sailing ship in the, in the bottom of the um, bowl was an, uh, taken from a photograph. I used the photograph that I'd taken from a boat when I was uh, in the Caribbean of a tall sailing ship. So. Again, all of the images are my own images. I don't use any um, commercial images or clip art. I draw all of my images original um, and then use them on my pieces. It's very important for me to have that kind of um, authenticity in my work uh, so that it feels, I really feel like each decision that one makes when they're making their work from the materials, uh, the processes they choose, the tools that they choose, along with the images, all become part of the soul of the work. And it can really, it really translates um, into a more evocative work when all of that is uh, attended with, uh, attended to with care and thoughtfulness. This is the same bowl on the underside again. I chose this vessel shape again to represent a vessel and then again uh, painted the vessel on the on the bottom of it. And there is again the Yerba Mansa flower. And this is the very bottom of the of the bowl. And that is all hand painted onto the to the bottom of the bowl along with my etching into the surface of the clay, which that etching style again is uh, representative of the scrimshaw style. And of course, I chose the white, uh, this ivory colored clay to represent ivory or bone. This was a commission piece created for friends who uh, both of them, they used to live near, um, one of them worked in with boats for many years. So they asked that there be a boat on there and they love to travel. So this was all about their travels and, and uh, uh, around the world and, and more of a personal piece for these two friends. Again, in the scrimshaw style, representing the, the sailor's art of scrimshaw. This was a piece of part of a large collection of um, prototypes that I created for anthropology, which is a um, clothing and homeware store in the United States and in Europe. And uh, they asked me to create a large pedestal piece with the rabbits. So this, when, when a job like this comes through, oftentimes there is not a personal story, but um, images that the retailer will ask you to create or to include on the piece. And this is the surface of the piece. Um, many things are going on on this surface. There is, if you can see, there are the etched feathers and then there are the feathers that are white are in relief, which is a, is a treatment called water abrasion. And then the mushrooms are both etched and a combination of etching and water abrasion. And the rabbit is hand painted on the surface. This was um, uh, recreated and um, sold in retail shops for a season, which is just uh, a holiday season. So for three months in 2014. Uh, this came out of a little bit of order here. Um, in 2012, I started, uh, I had, was invited to be in a show called Clay as Canvas. Um, at this time I was going on, a, I was in a bit of a spiritual journey, going through some difficult times in my life. And uh, a lot of this is symbolic of um, some of the things that I was processing at the time. And uh, the acorns in there were representative of <clears throat> knowledge and understanding. Um, and each, even each circle and number of the dots um, all represent a very specific 
moment in time of my my journey. And these are all these were all wall hangings uh, platters, but again, I stacked them up just to to and to show that they create a story together and separate. This is another piece that was uh, for the anthropology um, commission, and uh, they asked me to create a bowl. This one, I love this one because I created it to look like a whale tail. And I love this side shot of the piece. Um, this had elaborate etching and drawing all on the interior and uh, exterior of the piece. Another piece from that uh, group of collect that collection of work that I created for anthropology, a picture. This was hand built. Again, I know no surface is safe with me. So uh, bottom of a piece is as important as the top of a piece um and the inside and to understand that when you look at one of uh, a ceramic object it is a three-dimensional object and it's an opportunity to continue to tell a story and also for all the edges and handles and bottom all to communicate and when you look at something from different angles um, you get a new opportunity to to um, create visual interest and this was also reproduced and uh, and uh, but with, through a frat factory in China and sold in stores in the United States for that um, fall season. And this again was another was a uh, place setting that I created for anthropology as well. Uh, I started slip casting my work, which if you're not familiar with slip casting, it's the art of using a liquid clay slip poured into plaster molds um, that, are, um, math, that are master molds of a form that you uh, make. And um, I did it as a way to speed up my process and to also to be able to create um, uniform pieces, multiples uni of the multiple pieces of the same size. I don't know if it ever sped up my process. I think there is a lot of um, thought that slip casting is cheating, but um, if you're a person who is a potter purist, which I am not, um, uh, in fact, I think slip casting is as much or sometimes more work, but I was working with a lot of, um, I had moved at this time to from San Francisco to a small town in the California foothills called Nevada City. And I was spending a lot of time in nature and in forests and amongst flowers. And a lot of this work represents this time in my life. Again, these are native California flowers um, uh, etched on the surface. These are also slip cast, the canteen vases. I think this by far has been my most popular piece that I've created over the years. Um, and uh, they're two sided. So one, this one side would um, be etched and then the other side also has uh, designs on it. And this is indicative. This is just my pure etching style and drawn directly into the surface. And again, my own original drawings and the hand stippled marks are all the little dots, the radiating dots uh, I use to create energy and movement in my work. Um, they're all done one at a time. Uh, I don't have a special tool. Uh, another question that people ask me all the time. So yeah, that just take it's a lot of just time spending dotting one dot at a time. Uh, this is a uh, this piece. I started bringing in Hungarian embroidery image into my uh, imagery into my work. So those dark black flower images are actually um, uh, Hungarian parts of Hungarian embroidery motifs. And on the edges of this platter, there were um, our pine, pine, uh, little pine branches uh, drawing that I did from a piece of pine that I picked up from the forest on one of my walks. I was collecting many feathers, finding many feathers in the forest as well at this time. So this is all sort of narrative of, uh, of the place and time um, in my life. Again, um, I started throwing. Um, I hadn't thrown for about 20 years. 
I was hand building my work in slip casting and I decided I wanted to bring uh, the potter's wheel back into my studio and start throwing work. So these are some of my early thrown pieces after taking a long break. I created these pieces for a fundraiser um, and they were auctioned and sold. And again, another platter. Um, both again, I this is a sort of side looking across the platter and then straight on and how much you can see how much a, a three dimensional piece can change in a from a different vantage point. <clears throat> Swallows again are another another reoccurring theme in my pieces and the swallow is known to fly away and always come back to home. So again, it's a the animals in the are often representational of me in my life and I had just left California and moved to Oregon and so all of the flowers in the uh, this these pieces are California flowers the Matea poppy and California poppies and the pine branches um, and this was represented I was and I also um, was in a new relationship so this was all about love and moving and leaving my home and uh, moving to a new place. Um, in 2016, my friend Shannon Garson, she's an Australian potter. You may have seen her online. She does uh, beautiful work. Um, we became friends in, the, in 2006 first. We were both writing blogs. And then in 2013, I was invited to Australia to be a master presenter at Clay Gulgong. And I met Shannon for the first time in real life. And then she came to the United States for an NCCA conference and stayed with me. And um, we just start, started a co collaboration that will co that's continuing on. It's uh, ongoing. Uh, we hope to eventually have a show with the collaboration of our work. So how we would how we work together is that we create uh, in this case, because we were in my studio, I created the form. And then um, I would paint on the piece and we would do this all together uh, in the same room and I would pass the piece to her and she would paint on it. So we, it was basically like an ongoing painting drawing um, uh, session between the two of us that would uh, happen over a course of um, a few days. And so that you can recognize the rabbit imagery and the and the coyote imagery on there as mine. And then Shannon went in. She has a very painterly style. And the images over the coyote are actually a map of the uh, area I was living in in the Yuba River Valley. So there was all this narrative and uh, integration of landscape and and our, our story and experience together. These were the first pieces we created together. You can see my etched images. These forms are my forms, and then with Shannon's um, forms. We were also using um, native clays that she brought from Australia. She created terra sigillatas. Uh, so again, the use of materials and the choice of materials indicate region and uh, and and landscape. Uh, Shannon revisited again the following year, and we created these pieces. This time, she through the pieces, so she, these are her forms, and we were using a native California clay, and again, you'll recognize my imagery along with, um, married with Shannon's imagery. Collaboration is really a fun thing to do. I it, um, This time I started to, I was, I had become kind of burnt out from doing the etched, etched style that I'm so well known for. And um, the collaboration really helped kind of was part of transition that I've been going through for the last six or seven years with my work and trying to um, just move and push my boundaries and learn and integrate new things into my work. Uh, I think sometimes things can become popular, but they can also become burdensome if you're required to make them over and over again. So collaborating with Shannon um, really helped break me out of some of the rut I was feeling for many years. At the time I was living in this beautiful place called Nevada City that um, the heart of this area is the Yuba River. It's an emerald green river. It's beautiful. Um, the local people 
um, treasure this river. And I spent many time, many days uh, hiking along the edges of it and just enjoying it, swimming in it. And this became an influence of this new work of the river stones. Um, and I started moving away. I was experimenting with moving away from literal imagery into more abstract imagery, still integrating my etching style, but also layering color. Um, and these pieces, I actually sanded the outside of them so that when you touch them, they feel like the actual stones from the river, which when you laid on the stones at the river in the hot sun, they were warm and they set smell, they smell very like minerals. So I was really trying to sort of conjure the feeling from touch of the stones onto my pieces. Yeah, this is a little sugar bowl that I made using that same style. I had just moved to Portland, Oregon, which is about 500 miles from where I was living before. And it was autumn and the trees were changing color. And so that color palette really influenced um, my uh, started to come into my work and I started to transition from using brighter colors and light clay bodies to darker clay bodies. This was about three years ago. And you can see and this is a combination of the etched style with the river influence. And again, you see the little chicken mark hat cross hatchings in the front. So this was made in 2018. Um, with my more simple work with the stenciled images on there, which I cre started creating more simple tabletop wear um, for just functional work as opposed to the more elaborate um, art pieces that I've been making for so many years. After living by that beautiful river, I moved to a to Portland, Oregon, which is a very urban space. And this is a bridge that actually can see out my window uh, from where I live. Um, but you, you'll start to notice that some of the urban landscape and lines and structure of an urban landscape start to enter into my work again. This was the first work that I uh, created after moving to Portland. And you can see it's getting dark, getting darker. Uh, the clay, the um, imagery is starting to change again, affected by the light. Uh, Portland has very dark winters uh, and very light summers. So we have about right now we're having about 17 hours of light a day. And in the winter, it reverses. <laughs> we have about 17 hours of dark in the winter. So that really starts to show up in my work. Sometimes I don't know I'm doing it consciously, but I have, I am so, um, I process my environment into my, and it comes through in my work. And sometimes I look back at the work and I'm like, oh, I can see I was bringing that into the work without consciously doing it. Um, it's a very rainy place where I moved to. So this was the early sort of representation of the rain and the butterfly again, representation of myself, sort of this new life the chrysalis you know moving in and opening up into a new a new chapter of my life um, when i first moved to portland there are many fruit trees um, around uh, the city that um, people don't pick the fruit and i was um, making many cakes from the fruit so i started becoming obsessed with cake plates so these are my interpretation of a cake plate um, and so again the form is uh, a, you know, representative of the time that I was making many cakes and um, this new land that I was living in that was a rainy land that I was living in. These pieces were made for a show that I was, a uh, solo show I had at a gallery in North Carolina in the United States. Um, again, you can see no surface is um, unattended to in my work. So that's the interior of the bowl and the exterior of the bowl. And I'm working with um, many layers of between slip, hand painting, etching, and then stencil work as well. And then using glaze work again as another um, layering effect. <clears throat> These 
pieces are not completely glazed, but partially glazed. And you can really see it in the picture on the right where there are highlights of glaze, um, glaze on the surface. And then there are, are unglazed surfaces. And I really like my, wanted my pieces to feel textural as well as um, be visually interesting and also for a light to be captured on certain areas of the piece to draw the viewer in. More of the cake plates um, piled up on each other. Again, showing that the pieces work individually and as together in the collection. And another piece from that show. This is from all the different sides of the of the bowl. And again, the vase, and you can see I did the glaze work on the raindrops coming down on the surface, which again are very shiny against the matte surface. Uh, and I really love the interplay of the glaze with the uh, matte and all the surface um, texture that's happening in the piece. So they feel they're tactile while also um, visually catching light. I was uh, participated. I, I was. I'm been very interested in wood firing, and up in Oregon, there's a um, kiln that was built in the 1970s, an Anagama kiln, which is like a snake kiln. It's a 47 foot kiln that uh, is wood fired, and it takes a, a week of uh, 24 hour attending to and firing with wood. And it requires a large community of people to come together to um, attend to tend to this kiln. And I participated in this wood firing in the fall of 2019. And uh, these are some of the pictures from that that week. Um, I met someone at that wood firing who is a potter who throws these beautiful forms, and we decided to collaborate. And this was the first. Um, one of the pieces that came from our from the, one of the firings we did together, um, using my technique on her forms. This is relief work, hand painted and etched, and it comes out. It's all the same um, approach as the colorful work, but put into a kiln for um, a week, uh, reaching very high temperatures. And the kiln, there's no glaze that's put on these surfaces. So this is all soot and ash that melt onto the surface and really create, you know, very different visual effects. I was really curious to see what would happen to my surfaces um, in that environment. And this is another piece that came from that firing. This is all one piece and the different sides of it. Um, and depending on where the piece is put in the kiln really changes and affects how the firing, um, what will happen with the surfaces, but there is no control um, what happens. So it's all um, a surprise. Um, this is, I'm really kind of full on into my stencil work now. And uh, these are, um, about four inches big collection of um, wall tiles that I create and they're images from my daily life and adventures and things that I go out and see in the world and come home and do drawings of and create stencils of um, and to create one story. Some of my functional work um, again, this is I started wanting to just make purely functional work for use and pleasure. And um, the pourers, uh, the, the hand pourers, I created the spout. I first designed those pourers when I was living in Nevada City, which is an old gold mining town. And throughout um, the, the, the country around it, there are um, remnants of the gold mining um, era. And there are water troughs that bring water down into um, a lot of the waterways. And so the spouts on the pores were modeled after these troughs that I was finding in the woods. Um, so they are the forms are representative of the time that I lived in that area and the um, the old uh, wooden trough 
waterways that I was finding in the while I was on long walk while I would go hiking. These are more um, current pieces with the stencil work. Uh, I just made these probably six months, five months ago. Again, just simple, useful, handmade um, bugs. And living in Portland, I was I started becoming interested in bringing numbers into my work, and um, I actually didn't know why it just started happening. And uh, there's a lot of trains and as you can see in this photograph, this is a building in, in Portland with big numbers painted on it. And I realized, oh, I was seeing this in my in, in the landscape and it was just kind of coming through me. And so I started integrating numbers into my work. Um, this is all stencil work and etched work, uh, wheel thrown. And my images are starting to become more stylized, more graphic. I've in, been interested in uh, less realistic drawings and more graphic um, images. I'm really influenced by old movie posters and and uh, uh, from the from like from um, and old match boxes from Eastern Europe. So some of uh, some of that's influencing my drawing style. This is all the same cup. So again, a very three dimensional object. Uh, you get the rabbit on one side and each time you with every turn of the cup you'll see different images and this is now I'm using um, stencils and then newsprint transfer for all the color work on the piece and these are very recent pieces um, using this all of those techniques and these are you know me's that I just sent that are going to be in a show that's opening on June 18th here in the United States at Clay Uh I'm the ocean imagery comes back and forth into my work. I'm living near the ocean and in fact right now at the beach um, and we do have whale migrations. So the whales show up. more of the stencil uh, colors kind of coming back into my work again. Uh, it seems to kind of, I leave it for a while and then I get seduced by it again. So this has been fun, a um, little more playful work. Also, my images are starting to get less literal and more representational, playing around with more graphic forms and graphic surfaces. And again, the bottoms. Uh, because you want to give the person who's sitting across from you a little special treat if they're when you lift your cup up so that they're they get something to look at too. And this is the other side of the same cups. So again, um, they completely change depending on how you turn the cups around. And me at the end with another little dog. I start off with a little dog, and this is my dog Louie. Uh, this is in, it was taken a few years ago in my old studio in San Francisco. And uh, that's it. Thank you for, for for coming and joining and listening. Tina, it was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, pictures. Uh, we can see the transformation of your work from your starting years till now. Can you hear me, Diana? I, I can. I'm trying to get the video back on, but for some reason, <laughs> okay. it's not 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 coming on. Oh, let's see here. Let's uh, you see. need to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Share video you to, or no? No, uh, you need to stop sharing first, and then uh, you can Where on the video. Yeah. How do I stop the sharing? I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. The same uh, up arrow button. Uh, you need to press it that, and uh, but, but yeah. I'm only I'm only I'm only getting share video or share photo, so I'm not getting the stop. You see? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, just um, put on the uh, video camera, which is like turn off. You can just on it. It's not giving me an option to turn it off. Let me see here. 
okay. turn off incoming. They're not that. No. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, good evening, Diana. Uh, there's so a stop to... presenting. Stop presenting button right in front of you. Uh, I can't. I don't. Oh, there it is. Oh in in God, a center. In a center. Yeah. I, I sigh. It's like so small. Okay, there we go. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. It was a wonderful presentation, Diana. And we have so many questions for you. Okay. So Here I will go. request all the participants also uh, to put up all your questions in a chat box. Uh, so like, uh, you know, Diana will be answering uh, one on one. So like starting with my questions, I have too many questions for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I've been following your work since like past 10 years, you can say I have seen it and I really loved your illustrations uh, on, uh, you know, please. So my first question to you is like, why tableware, Diana? So like I've never seen you working on any uh, like, you know, sculptural forms or any like different kind of forms, only tableware. Why is this? <laughs> why is this? So this is a great question. So when I went to school in the late 80s and 90s in the time that, you know, every every generation of makers influences makers and what is being made in the world. And this was pre-internet. We, we didn't have Instagram. So whoever you were around in your art circle influenced your work. And I went to a school which was actually very sculpture oriented and very anti-pottery. And I was always interested in surface work more than the forms. And because I had this printmaking background and painter's background, um, I was being a little bit rebellious. I wanted to make fine art on functional forms. Um, it was also a representation of where I was at and where I actually continue to be at economically. I could not... I could not make a large sculpture because I had nowhere to put them and store them because it requires money uh, to not only make them and large equipment to make them, large kilns, um, but I also, you have to store them somewhere if they're not sold. So you have to pay for the building. So it was a little bit of a rebellious act to work on functional forms. I wanted to say here, I'm elevating a functional form to a fine art piece and using the form, the, the um, uh, tabletop form as a canvas for fine art work. Right. Yeah, that, that's, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> uh, we also over here face, we are also facing the same issues like what you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, one more question I want to ask you, like, uh, like how important do you see the act of creating handmade goods in these days and age? Like uh, I, have the, I have read your article in Ceramic Monthly a uh, long time mm -hmm. back, how to, sell your, yeah, how to sell your work online. So just can you just elaborate a little more about it? Oh, that's, you know, that's changes for me over time. And as I evolve as a maker and where my priorities have shifted, and I have to honestly say now that is not something that is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. It used to be something I spent a lot of time thinking about. I am, I'm definitely at a personally at a place where I want to make what I want to make and I'm not paying attention to trend or the importance, I those are not things that fuel my decision making the same way they once did. And with that in mind, I also, um, the explosion of handmade and availability of handmade wares, um, because I, I when I started working in the field of ceramics 35 years ago, nobody cared about it, no one was doing it. It was the dark horse of the art world. So it was actually what you see, the explosion that you see happening out in the world started many by people like me trying to get it um, visible. Um, when I went to school, they didn't want us to make tabletop wear because you couldn't get the 
you couldn't be, you wouldn't be paid for your actual work and time investment. Also, the people I was taught by, they wanted to elevate ceramics to fine art, to be recognized as a fine art. So all of that information and has been part of my um, narrative and has um, uh, pushed me in different ways. And I think, you know, I don't know if I'm really answering your question very directly and I don't mean to avoid it. It's just that it's not something I, I think about in a really direct way today. Um, does so what will, what, uh, what will be your advice for the, our upcoming uh, students or the upcoming artists who wants to sell their work online? Uh, so I think that yeah, my advice is to go for it. I do believe you should make what you want to make. If that is your passion, if tabletop and um, functional work is your passion, then that is the thing that you should pursue. That there is no um, right or wrong way or better thing to make that if you know um i spent so many years responding to some of the influences that i wanted to reject um and had voices in my head that were making telling me that what i was doing was wrong or bad um i wouldn't want anyone to feel that way i think all of it is important i think all of it is a dialogue i think uh having handmade on people's tables um creates um education for folks who don't maybe even know about ceramics and brings it into their lives yeah okay right. uh so we have some questions in our chat box uh like your work seems to be in a many layers of overlapping of colors so how do you maintain a freshness of each individual color uh well that's those are all techniques and i that's another word. That's a workshop. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, we'll come to yeah. that. We'll come to that thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so those are all um, different techniques, and just learning how to use those techniques in conjunction with one another, so that you can keep clear fields of color. Yeah. So, like, we have again one more similar kind of question. Lovely presentation and beautiful illustration. Uh, could you please share a bit about the process too? Thank you. So, yeah. So, we'll be sharing that information in a while. Uh, so, yeah. So, mm -hmm. we'll take another question. Uh, beautiful work. Can you share a process the on glaze stains, glazes, temperature fired at? Also, how do you fire please with uh, which have designs on bottom two? Uh, okay, so I think I understand those questions. Um, yeah. The uh, temperature fire, I fire to mid range, so cone six. But throughout, like my earlier work, I was firing to cone three. I was using the kiln as part of my um, to achieve certain colors. I wanted, I was using commercial underglazes, um, and I wanted to change the color so they didn't look fresh out of the bottle color. So using the temperature of your kiln can change the colors of, at hotter or lower temperatures. And so my firing temperature has changed over the years, but I am firing at cone six now and how I um, am able to apply color on the bottom. Um, the, the, mo the pieces that were glazed on the bottom, they were stilted on something that's called a kiln stilt, which is a little clay piece that has little uh, pieces of nichrome wire that lift it off so it won't sit on the actual kiln shelf. Um, and they, the piece will sit on the little tips of the, the wire and uh, can fire at high temperature. And that's the way you can fire something with glaze on the bottom without it fusing to the kiln shelf. And as far as my process, that's hours of conversation. So we'll- That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so hope, Anshu, you got your answers. Uh, so there's one more question. Hello, Dinah. I love your style. Questions about itching. Do you use a glaze that you wipe off uh, to get the itching to pop or it is the color of the clay body that we see? Uh, it, I'm using actually uh, not, those are none of the ways I do it. I use the clay body is etched into and then there is well, there is color put on top of the clay body and then it's etched into, it's bisque, and then there are stains that I actually put into the surface. And then those are wiped away, very similar to a etching process, and then, and then they're sealed with glaze. 
that's great. Uh, so there's one more question. Uh, great work, uh, each uh, having a story and that's uh, really a cross. Coming from the heart, loved it. Do you use stains, uh, slips or underglazes for this work? All of them. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I use all of them. I use, yeah. and I more recently I used commercial underglaze and and then stains for many years. But I'm moving away from that now, and now I'm making homemade slips for my and some a little bit of underglaze. But so now I'm using slip underglaze. Sometimes I use terrace geladas, which I make from earth that I dig up, clay that I dig up um, in my region, and then. Um, uh stains as well and glaze so like what's your personal favorite like slips under glaze or stains what you will love to work there is no they they're all part of the whole so i don't have a favorite that's like asking me to pick a favorite color i can't answer <laughs> that question <laughs> <laughs> it will change every minute <laughs> Right, right. So uh, we have been uh, looking at your work. So it's a lot of uh, nature inspired and uh, like it's a, a kind of like uh, telling us a story about something. So uh, so have you ever considering Indian folk art? Uh, like we have a wonderful folk arts like Madhubani painting, Wali painting or Patachitra. So have you ever considered doing uh, like, you know, putting uh, that kind of work on your work, uh, your products? Um, Oh, so this is something that's actually a really good question, and I think it's a good conversation to have. Um, I have I have my own culture, Hungarian culture, which has a very strong visual culture. So when I am, I have, and then I have my American culture and the nature that I live in, which influences my work. So I really want my work to be authentic from my own cultural cultural experience and my own personal experience. For me to use Indian imagery as much as I love it and I appreciate it visually, uh, would be an appropriation of a culture that is not my culture. Okay. So, and, but, and I, so I would love to see someone in India do it, who is, yeah. it is their culture <laughs> and their language, but it isn't my language. Right, right. That's, that's yeah, bad so, enough. And if maybe if I came to India, and had an experience there that would come into my work but i yeah. have right yes yes yes, yeah. yes so we are really looking forward to visit india soon <laughs> yes i'm looking forward to let's make covid go away so i can come yes definitely <laughs> so i really uh, love the idea of uh, you know numbering uh, your work series uh, like mm -hmm. but it looks like a part of your design also, so like how you got, uh, you know, uh, idea about doing such things like numbering your work. I think, well, it just, it started, um, I've used that chicken scratch. We call it, I don't know if you do the same thing. We call it chicken scratch here um, where you mark and you cross hatch through. And I just um, started doing it and I had done it in early work in art school. And it just, I noticed I had a print that I did that in. And so it's just about my visual my visual language and how I communicate. And it just became, a, um, it just became, a, a, someone was outside the window. Sorry, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I was like, you're walking yeah. outside there. Um, it's become part of my, uh, not super conscious, you know, I think when you, we create, for me, my work is about this collection of uh, uh, this huge collection, visual library that I collect of images, and I put them together to create stories. So in a lot of ways, I work very in sort of compartments, like I have drawings and I create images, and then I put them together in stories. I can grab them and use them. And that is just one element of my visual story. And keeping it consistent creates just by using it over and over again over the years creates its own story right so yeah. you just find that thing that is yours and you put it in your work and you know i think it's mostly about i think saying bold is it sounds kind of arrogant but it's more like just being confident to to use your marks and make your own marks in your work and those start to take on a life of their own 
Yeah. So there's a one last question from my side. <laughs> so I lo I, uh, I love your uh, process of feeling uh, like it's so mesmerizing to watch. So I would request all the participants you should visit her Instagram handle and see the uh, videos she has posted. It it's just amazing. So uh, Dina. Uh, so we'll come to our surprise uh, uh, thing. Uh, so would you like to say something to all our part participants? Yeah, so I'm so sorry, um, Shri, that I did not include a peeling video for you all. I think that's why you asked and you, I forgot, I didn't even think about it. I could have, but I didn't even <laughs> think about it. So you'll have to go to my Instagram to look. Yes. Um, also, I have two online workshops that are recorded workshops that are available. They're available um, in, perpetu per in perpetuity. Um, so uh and because you all have participated today we have i have a special discount code for you to take the workshops there's you there the it's one discount code for both workshops you can take one or both of them yasha shri will um, provide you with the links to the workshops as along with the discount code that you can use and it's good until june 30th and then it will expire so um, yes. Just a little, a little gift to you from me for showing up today. We are so thankful for that. <laughs> People would love to attend your workshop. So for the all, for all the participants, uh, the discount code and the link for the workshops uh, will be sending you through emails. And uh, like, uh, I would thank you all for participating for joining us today. And special thanks to Gauri sir for letting me. Like giving me this opportunity to host you, <laughs> and uh, our uh, next uh, guest uh, speaker is uh, Tushar Savant, uh, who uh, who will be like we'll be hosting it on twenty fifth June, twenty twenty one. So stay tuned and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at IES Center for Ceramic Design. And again, thank you so much, uh, Diana, for taking time out for us and sharing us a wonderful experience. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much for inviting me. This was very fun and I enjoyed it. And I um, and I hope to visit you sometime soon. Sure, sure. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. Looking forward. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah, thank do, you want me you. To stay on, do you need me to stay on, Yasha Shri? Uh, no, that we are done with it then. OK, thank you, thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye. See you Thank soon. You.